Um, and I know we might have more people join and we just have, this is just a compilation of, of different synagogues from all over the world. I'm gonna stop the share. Um, and hopefully if you're able to unmute in a minute, um, I just wanna welcome everyone. This is a new class will run, you know, certainly will run during the typical Weingold class period until the week before Thanksgiving. And, and if there's interest, look forward to continuing weekly uh, with, with everyone because there's no shortage of, of incredible uh, and unique synagogues all over the world. Um, and I guess one thing that brought me to, uh, to this topic and to, to share with, with everyone and really to learn from all of you as well and discuss with everyone um, is that I know um, personally, you know, I'm someone that loves to explore and travel and been fortunate to, to travel to many places. Uh, that's of course kind of been been shut down for for most of us, if, all of us, during the past uh, six seven months. And and you know, hopefully sooner rather than later, the world will open up to to explore um, again. Um, and one thing that I often uh, like to do when I when I am traveling in a new place is check out uh, the Jewish life in the congregation. Sometimes the Jewish communities that exist currently in certain places. There may not be as flourishing Jewish life today, but but it has been uh, in the past, um, and and so um, I look forward to exploring synagogues first today. Kind of an overview of kind of where did the synagogue come from, uh, and and look at a couple um, prominent synagogues, some of the longest uh, synagogues in continuous use. Uh, today and then explore different congregations and love to hear from you if there's any particular communities uh, or synagogues that you're interested in. But I wanted to go around. I'll call on, on names since we don't have <laughs> in in order. If you want to just introduce yourself um, and maybe a particular uh, unique synagogue that you've that you've been to that you've found kind of is is among the most interesting synagogues you've been to or, or heard about uh, in in your life. And I'll and then. Uh, kind of, I'll jump into uh, to kind of where did synagogues originally come from, and and would love discussion and sharing. As I have kind of two synagogues for today that I wanted to look at, uh, but have others kind of depending that in ready to to share if uh, if you're interested. So Helen, if you want to share, just introduce yourself and and maybe one unique synagogue that you've that you've been to. Okay, I'm Helen Wolf. My husband is Paul. And we've been fortunate to be able to travel a little bit to some unique places. Um, in 2009, we went to Poland and the Ukraine. And I think one of the synagogues that impressed me quite a bit was the synagogue in the old town Krakow. And that's the Remu Synagogue. Um, the reason for this is that when Moses sister leaves, this was his synagogue and that's my husband's grandfather 34 times removed. I'm very much into genealogy and we were able to sit where he sat and saw what he saw. Good, but yeah, no, I'm great. I've actually had the opportunity to be there as well in the cemetery outside, I believe, where he- He's buried there, there. correct. And, and the Nazis left his grave. They were afraid that his spirit would come and do bad things to them. So everything was left intact. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Karen. Hi, I'm Karen Barson. And um, I don't know if I have a particular one, but one that I wanted hey, to froze. see um, is we were supposed to go on a river cruise this year in April, and it's been rescheduled for next April, My internet but we probably won't make that one either. Um, but we were supposed to do a tour of the Jewish um, quarter in Cologne. And I really would love to find out if, about what they have there. Good, Cologne, yeah, great. And, and God willing, you'll be able to take that trip, <laughs> if not this, at some point, but, yeah. but that's great. Uh, yeah, Sandy and, and Bob, yeah. And Robert, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm mute. mute. I'm unmuted. Karen, we were on that river boat and we did see the synagogue in Cologne, which mm -hmm. was interesting because everything was in Russian because oh. the Jewish population there had escaped the Soviet Union mm -hmm. and they were, uh, I think the most, the two most interesting that stick in my mind. Um, we went to, 
verbs on the Rhine in Germany because Bach oh, yeah. was born there. And that's the Rashi synagogue, which was rebuilt mm -hmm. after the war. And um, that one, well, was emotional for us. And then also, Bob, you want to talk about, Bu and we were in Budapest. And I felt like when I walked into a synagogue there, I felt like I was walking into the old temple on the Heights. Yeah, there's a few, but the Dohani Street Synagogue, yeah, the, large, the, one, yeah. the largest synagogue in Europe. Yeah, yeah. beautiful. And it's beautiful. <laughs> and if you, before your time, if you walked into the temple on the Heights, you got the same feeling. And that's when I knew that this was a Hungarian congregation that came over. <laughs> yeah. Good. Good. Um, yeah, Fran. Um, I think uh, I've, I've been to many when I travel. I try to find the synagogues, but I think the Sephardic ones always seem a little bit more exotic to me because it's not my tradition. Um, so I would dominate uh, the Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam and the uh, oh. Sephardic synagogue in Curaçao with the with the uh, uh, sand floors. With the sand floor, yes. <laughs> Beautiful. Good, uh, Nina and Larry. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Good morning. You, you can start. Okay. Uh, <laughs> me, it's a, a few synagogues. Also, I was fortunate um, when I lived in Israel. I worked in Beit Hatzpitzot, the Jasper Museum, which has the models of synagogues yeah. throughout the world. Some still exist, and some not. So when I traveled through Europe, um, I also had a chance to go to the uh, Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam, and then also in uh, Florence, there is a large, yeah. large synagogue which looks almost like a, a Moorish kind of style with tiles and things like that. And that one kind of stands out. Done. Yeah, um, Alec. Yeah, uh, uh, I want to mention the Portuguese synagogue in New York City. You got to do more than walk through. You got to go there for Shabbos yeah. <laughs> with the guys in the top hats and the, and the and the boys choir. It uh, and it, it is a beautiful. But the synagogue that has uh, that resonates the most with me is a small little uh, Stiebel synagogue in Toronto. I happened to be uh, there. I was saying Kaddish for my mother, and this was a weekday. And I uh, I asked the doorman. I says, "Where's the closest synagogue?" And he says, well, there's one around the corner, very, very small, very wooden, but they were Vilna people. So I walked in, I, I, I put on my talus, I laid to my tefillin, and, I, and people are turning around and applauding me. All, this is an old synagogue. I mean, it is, it is old, and, and old and just uh, uh, beautiful, it had a beauty of its own in its simplicity. And uh, the thing I remember most is they... Uh, they turned around and said, you're, you're, you're laying your tefillin like they do in, in our hometown of Vilna. I says, well, that's where my, where my family's from. So that left the biggest impression in, in, uh, in, in synagogue travels. Good, great. Do you know the name of the Stiebel by any time? I don't, I don't even know if you it's still there. It's Okay, well, need to, need to check it out because my yeah. sister lives in Toronto and I'm, you know, hopefully after the pandemic, we'll, we'll continue to be back in Toronto. Often. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, good. Lynn. I've been fortunate. Um, it's hard to decide. I've seen the synagogue in Istanbul. I think it was in Girona, Italy. I, I know there was another one in Italy, but I'm, for some reason, Girona sticks in my head. Venice, Hong Kong. Hong Kong was really cool. Just, yeah, oh, hello. Beautiful, and, yeah. And, and um, <laughs> I've seen the one in Florence from the outside, but it's never worked out to be able to go in. Um, but they are they are pretty amazing to see, and uh, and you know you try to imagine what 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 it was like. But there's in Venice, there's I'm you've been to Venice, Josh, right? The yes, I have. To, yeah. So one I've been to the synagogue. Yeah, there are yeah, the multiple synagogues actually. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but they're all but Istanbul is pretty cool because we went in. And we didn't have an appointment. It was really hard to find this place. And underneath the chairs were these hard hats. 
that's they had they put hard hats under the seats because they had had an earthquake in Istanbul, oh. and that was and that was kind of interesting. They were preparing for a wedding the day we walked in, so it was really cool. And they have the the upstairs and the downstairs, and and that was it. But I like can't wait to be able to go again. <laughs> Good, yeah. <laughs> Good, uh, Maddie. You want? One of the most interesting synagogues that I've been to is the Jerusalem Jubilee Synagogue in Prague. And the reason that I found that so interesting is because today it's a progressive egalitarian synagogue. And when you go to modern day Jewish communities in Europe, a lot of the today, a lot of the progressive communities are really in small buildings or hidden or in like an office building where they rented out space. But the Jubilee Synagogue is a progressive synagogue that has the beautiful architecture of um, older synagogues. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah, great. Great. Morris? Okay, we can come. Hi, up. yes, I had to unmute. Hi, and I don't know if Terry's yeah. there yet. But <laughs> there he is. Um, Hi. No, Terry's not. <laughs> no, just, okay. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, I'm Morris Amon. Um, I'm from Istanbul myself originally, so, uh, yeah, there are several interesting synagogues there, of course. Um, I think the most interesting one is the so-called Italian synagogue. Um, other than that, um, let's see, I've been to inside the one in Florence. It's absolutely gorgeous. There is a, I'm surprised nobody mentioned that. There are several very interesting or beautiful synagogues in Prague, um, including the one with Moorish architecture. I don't remember what no, it's that's, called. I think the one Maddie is just talking about, the Jubilee Synagogue, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the Jerusalem, yeah, and and uh, there was the um, synagogue in uh, Newport, uh, uh, Rhode Island, which is the yeah, oldest the, uh, synagogue right. in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then, uh, not uh, very spectacular, kind of modest, but very very interesting. Uh, in New York City, we went uh, one Shabbat morning to. to uh, the, the Yanina Synagogue, that's ah, the yes. only um, Romaniot synagogue yes. in uh, the U.S. The Romaniots are right. Greek, Greek speaking Greek Jews, not, Greek. Uh, not Sephardim. You know, everybody tends right. to dump anybody who is not in Ashkenazi into the Sephardic crowd, but they're not Sephardim. <laughs> yeah. No, we tend to think uh, that maybe this is an Ashkenazi-centric way of thinking that there's two there's Ashkenazim and Sephardim, but in reality there are yeah. there are a number of different uh, uh, kind of sub-ethnic groups within within Judaism that developed in different parts of the world. Yeah, good. Uh, Marilyn is I don't know if I'm not sure if anyone else. If anyone else comes on, I don't know if there's anyone else able to to unmute right now. Uh, but great to hear from everyone. And, and at the end, I'd love to hear if there's any specific places that you want to learn more about. Um, but I want to uh, to start actually with a synagogue. Uh, if you weren't here when we when I had this up, these are just a variety of synagogues. <laughs> um, in fact, the Jerusalem Jubilee Synagogue that Maddie mentioned. Uh, and Morris is, I believe, the one in the front here with the blue uh, Kind of with the blue uh, front with the wooden Jewish star. Um, but the first synagogue that I want to look at is our own. <laughs> um, so synagogues often have, um, have stories and the building that we go to that we see today may not be the original building uh, that the synagogue was, uh, was in. Um, and synagogues all have their own stories. So for instance, this was B'nai Asher and Congregation on Eagle Street. Helen, I might, as our histo resident historian, might, might, might be able to share even more. But I just want to quickly uh, look. This was the congregation from 1887 to 1906 um, until they, they moved here on East 55th and Scoville till 1923. And then the synagogue uh, that more of the people here will be familiar with, the Temple on the Heights, um, until 1980, uh, when we moved into our current our current location, which hopefully we'll all be able to be back in at some point uh, sooner rather than later, <laughs> um, 
But all of the synagogues and, and the synagogues, uh, one of the synagogues I'll share today, we know that sometimes synagogues are, might be even thousands of years old, but the building that exists today is not necessarily the same building uh, that existed uh, when the synagogue came to be. So I just want to pause the share. Does anyone um, want to share any thoughts? Kind of when did, when did, when did the first synagogue exist? Any Anything that you've that you've learned or or guess, and of when when did the very first synagogues uh, come about? The truth is, no one knows exactly for sure. So whatever you say is, <laughs> there's no uh, there's no definitive answer to this question. Right. I mean, you, you'll you'll see you'll see benches in Masada that look like they congregated. Right, the earliest, so good, the earliest known synagogue from, uh, from archeological sources, and it, it wasn't the synagogue itself, but his documents uh, mentioning it is actually from an island in Southern Egypt, Elephantine Island, um, where there was kind of a military outpost. And this is the third century before the common era, um, where there's discussion of a synagogue that was actually uh, erected. There was some building for Jewish prayer um, during the time of the second temple, but these were Jews that were on a military outpost far away from, from the temple in Jerusalem, and they established their own, uh, their own prayer site, their own synagogue. Um, while that's the earliest known site, um, it's believed that, that in the, during, throughout the time of the second temple, um, and after the, the first temple was destroyed, and there was kind of the first diaspora, if you will, of Jews around the ancient Near East, that synagogues started to be erected or, or places of worship, uh, maybe originally in private homes, but eventually buildings that were established for the purpose of prayer and, and congregating. Um, and so synagogues have actually been around for some 2,500 years. Um, the, oldest, um, the oldest archaeological site, and I'm going to jump ahead. Well, first, of course, before there was a synagogue, there was a temple. This is a model of the second temple. Maybe it's a model you're familiar with. Um, and so today, right, synagogues and, and synagogue worship takes the place of the temple. Interestingly, this model, um, right, is, is, uh, is of what the second temple looked like for only seven years. Um, we think of this as, oh, this is what the, what the temple looked like. And anyone who's seen pictures, um, the first temple, we have less of less knowledge of what it looked like, although there's models made based on what's what's written in the Bible. Um, this temple was based on the construction projects that were uh, that were started by Herod, um, which actually only were completed in the year 63 of the Common Era. And of course, the temple was destroyed in the year 70. So this model and the Western Wall, which we which we think about, um, are really only were only in existence. Um, in its completed form for seven years um, before the temple was destroyed. Um, here's actually the model, if you've been to the Holy Land, formerly the Holy Land Hotel, now at the Israel Museum, of what the old city um, is believed to have looked like uh, in, the, in Roman times. Um, and really a very impressive structure. In fact, one uh, well, well noted Roman, ancient Roman historian, Pliny the Elder, uh, who traveled around the Roman world, uh, commented in one of his writings uh, that if you haven't seen the temple in Jerusalem, you haven't seen the most beautiful building in the world. Um, really, in the Roman Empire, and, and by extension, really the whole world at that time, this was one of, if not, I mean, it's a subjective, but certainly one of the most impressive buildings in the entire world uh, in its time after this construction period. Um, of course, what's left of this is very minimal, and this little red area that you can see, um, which is not even of the temple itself, but of this outer barrier, this outer wall, this is basically the Western Wall Plaza that we go to today, is this small little area. Um, if you've taken the Kotel Tunnels, you can follow my, uh, my little arrow. The Kotel Tunnels go underground all the way to this, uh, to this garrison outpost at the very far end. And uh, in the last 20, 30 years, um, this part of the southern wall and these steps have also been excavated, of course, uh, that you can travel to see today. Um, but the western wall that we know of is actually just a very, very minute portion of, of the temple itself. Um, what some of you might be aware of, um, right, synagogue, as, as the second temple was built, not all Jews lived in so 
such close proximity to the temple in Jerusalem, there were already synagogues and places of, of worship that developed. Um, in Egypt and Alexandria in particular, where there was a very large Jewish community. In fact, around uh, the year zero, um, Alexandria is believed to be the largest city in the world, and it had five sectors, almost like five quarters, although I guess quarters isn't the right word with five, but two of them were considered Jewish quarters. Um, up to 40% of Alexandria, the largest city in the world, may have been Jewish at the time. Um, and it's believed, uh, many scholars say, up to a quarter of the entire ancient Near East was Jewish, actually, um, in, in late Greek times, early Roman times. Uh, so Jews spread out, and, and there were Jewish communities all over the ancient Near East, uh, many of which did not live so close to the temple. Um, and we have examples throughout Israel of ancient uh, ruins. Here's Kfar Bar'am. This is the oldest synagogue ruins themselves uh, that exists, and this is in Delos, uh, an island uh, near Mykonos in, in Greece, uh, built between the year 150 and 128 BCE um, in Delos, Greece. So this is actually the oldest known synagogue site anywhere in the world, actually. Um, but we'll see, um, and maybe you'll be able to share for me the two synagogues I really wanted to start exploring today. Um, one, the synagogue, the oldest synagogue in continuous use from its, uh, from its building until today, and the synagogue that's believed to have the longest continuous use, uh, although the building was renovated four different times on the space, and it's, it's gone into disuse more as a museum today just because the community doesn't exist there um, as, it, as it once did. Does anyone know or have a guess what the oldest synagogue in the world in continuous use is? Uh, now, some people mention the city, so I've, I know some people have been there. Maddie, yeah. alt new Shul in Prague? Correct. <laughs> yeah, Maddie's, Maddie's right. The alt new Shul, um in Prague, which we're going to visit here. Um, and this is how, can you guys see that screen? Yeah. Of the alt new Shul? Yes. <laughs> so some have been there, so... I wanted to think about the best way that we can travel to places, even though we're not in the places themselves. Um, so I'm going to use a variety of some videos, and this is actually a 360, so we can we can tour. We're walking down the street in Prague here, and see the kind of the the layers, and you can see the the synagogue, the Alt New Show, which literally means the old new synagogue, or in Czech, I believe it's called the Stara Nova synagogue, which is the same meaning, old new. Um, interestingly, and we say this often, right, originally it was called the New Shul or the Great Synagogue because when it was built, it was new. We see that all the time, that things are new, like the new gate in the old city of Jerusalem, circa 1880, but it's still called the New Gate because it's still the newest gate um, and the name kind of stuck. <laughs> so the New Shul, built in 1270, um, right here, um, is... Uh, is the oldest synagogues in continuous use with, with just four year exception uh, during the Holocaust. Um, it was actually used uh, by the Nazis uh, to store Jewish uh, relics, Jewish artifacts uh, for what they were intending to create a museum uh, basically of, of Jewish artifacts of a people that, that in their eyes would no longer exist. Um, and actually the, the Torah that we have, uh, the Leditz Torah that we have in our synagogue uh, was actually recovered from uh, the artifacts that was brought from Leditz to the alt new Shul, I believe, um, is, is my understanding. Uh, so we're, we'll go inside here. This is a cool feature. Not every place has this, but we're now inside the alt new Shul. Um, and it, you can also come, and I'm going to go slowly around... Oh. Let's see if I can do it slowly. Sometimes it takes me too fast. But we're going we're gonna to go slowly around the synagogue. And I know some of you have been to this synagogue. I want to kind of ask if you just want to unmute and share anything you're noticing about the synagogue um, as we move around. Don't you enter this? I remember going, but I went to all of them in Prague. Yeah. Don't you enter and go downstairs or, so, or you enter in the basement or something different about this synagogue? So you do enter kind of a, from a little lower level. Um, 
to be honest, I'm not sure um, the re you can see kind of the, the entrance right there. And if we go back, you might be able to see it. I don't know if you can see it in this picture. Um, I'm not sure actually why that why specifically that is, and I don't know that that was always the case. Um, well, I that think it was. I think they okay. had a I think they had a prohibition on the height of the synagogue, and they couldn't be taller than uh, than the the Christian buildings around it. And so, in order to have any kind of a majestic sense, they had to go subterranean uh, so that they would have some some kind of height good yes no and that's actually true uh, i believe that is true here and in, in a number of places um that was the case right typically the church spire in many communities needed to be the highest point um and uh and so that that makes a lot of sense and i i had forgotten that that was the reason but i believe you're that's correct um so Right, this synagogue though is is similar to many of the the cathedrals that were built in the same time, right? With the 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 twin naves, um, and looks inside actually the structure looks similar to any to many cathedrals that were built around the same time in terms of in terms of the design, um, and perhaps the most well known uh, rabbi from this synagogue, Rabbi Yehuda Lo, the Maharal. Um, was most well known. I mean, his a lot of rabbinic works, but most well known for the legend of the of the golem, uh, which uh, which according to legend was created in the attic of this of this synagogue to protect uh, the Jewish community uh, from outside attacks. And he's buried in the cemetery just outside. For those who have been to uh, to the to the large Jew Jewish cemetery uh, that that has hundreds of years of uh, of gravestones of Jews and Jewish leaders from the community. Uh, Prague itself uh, was one of the largest Jewish communities. In fact, throughout much of the 18th century, Prague was had the the largest Jewish population um, of any city. Sorry, of any city um, in the world. When when you say it's the oldest continuous use, what is uh, what is the, its use today? They have daily minion. So there are minion. So continuous use doesn't necessarily mean daily minion. Um, but there are minions that take place here um, on certain Shabbats and holidays, uh, still to this day in the Jewish community in Prague. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how regularly there's daily minion. I don't believe they have a daily minion every day at the at the Alt Nushal. But unlike the synagogue that we'll see next, this synagogue does have regular minions over the course of the year. Rabbi, um, oh, yeah, when, sorry, Larry? When was the shul opened? In other words, the original starting date of the shul. Well, this shul 1270. Um, the, earliest, the earliest records of Jews in Prague go back to the 900s or 800s of, of there being synagogues and, 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 large, and communities. This particular synagogue was, was built um, and and started in 1270. Um, and a lot of legend surround this particular synagogue. In fact, according to the to legend, there were angels that brought stones from the temple and from the Beit Hamikdash in Jerusalem, on condition that they would be returned to rebuild the temple when the Messiah comes. In fact, there's two understandings of the Alt Noi Shul. One is old new that when it first uh, was built, it was called the New Shul. Um, and, and at some point in history, uh, in the 1500s, they realized it's not really new anymore, and, and it took on the name Alt New, uh, Alt Noi. Uh, but there's this legend uh, that maybe its original name, uh, and it's somewhat shrouded in mystery just because of the length of time it's been around, is that maybe it was Altenai, which literally means on condition uh, in Hebrew. And it, it is connected to this legend that these stones from the Beit HaMikdash in Jerusalem were brought to this, to this site to build the, the shul on condition, al Tanai that they would be brought back to rebuild the temple, the Beit HaMikdash at the, at the proper time. Um, and this and other synagogues, I mean, one reason today that, that really not only Jews that go to Prague, but everyone that goes to Prague to visit Prague, almost everyone visits the Jewish quarter. Um, 
as because the J Jews actually comprised about one quarter of the, the residents of the city in the 18th century. Um, and while certainly doesn't have as large a community today, uh, Jews comprise a, a large um, and important part of Prague's history. Um, and at some point in time, uh, in the mid late 1500s, the Josephov Quarter, uh, while it was where the Jews lived, it kind of transitioned uh, over time into essentially a ghetto. That was where the Jews were were expected and 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 required at different points in history to live. Um, and so this thriving Jewish center uh, existed for centuries, and still to this day, um, the small Jewish community in Prague uh, really cherishes this this site. Um, as, as some of you mentioned, though, there are some beautiful synagogues, the Moorish style synagogue, the Jer Jerusalem Jubilee Synagogue, um, and others uh, that are in Prague to support the, uh, the Jewish community under 10,000 uh, today, I believe, uh, that live in Prague. Um, I might need to get the exact, the exact figure, but, but, uh, but still kind of operates uh, the Jewish museum and, and sites in Prague today. Yeah, uh, Fran. Um. What I remember that was very unique about the entire uh, set of synagogues in that uh, quarter is that they weren't bombed during World War II and they weren't destroyed during Kristallnacht. They had their own fires and they had their own reconstructions, but they are the closest thing to untouched that we have in, in Europe. And so it's very, very special to go visit there. Right. In terms of an entire Jewish quarter, um, it's special. And as we know that uh, the Nazis were looking and were storing things for, for a museum to the people that was um, in that space, which may be why, which is uh, one of the main reasons why perhaps it wasn't destroyed, um, which not necessarily a great reason for that, but, uh, but is really very meaningful and special to be able to go and see, see that area in its entirety. As, as Helen mentioned, the Ramah Synagogue, um, unfortunately, many of the synagogues in Krakow, while there's still much there, there's also a lot that was that was destroyed um, there and in yeah. many in many European communities. Um, I want to jump to now uh, what's yeah. believed to be the. Oh, sorry, Helen. Yeah, I was just going to say you mentioned about the Lenox uh, Torah that it might have come from here. I do know that the other Torah that is in the Ark did come from the Alt Shul. I thought the Lennox one came oh, sorry. from the London Trust. No, you're correct. The, the, it's not the letter. The Torah that's in the that's in the in the sanctuary. I misspoke. You're right. This Torah that's the lower central Torah in the sanctuary. The one um, with the red cover. The one with the red cover that's only read a couple times a year. Yom Kippur and uh, now I'm living, but uh, but on Yom Kippur and one or two other times uh, during the year. Um, it was was the Torah from here. You're right. The Lettuce Torah came from the London Trust, actually, which um, just from a separate location. But the Holocaust, the Torah that was saved from the Holocaust, came from from original was saved from the Alt Neuschul. I, we may not know exactly where it was from before that. And Helen, maybe you know. I don't know if if the synagogue um, knows. I did the research for Rabbi Hal just a few weeks ago. If you one, right. if you haven't seen the video that was put out about the seven Torahs. Right, the most interesting um, Torahs in the world is, is it, but it's a, yeah, the video, that was what it was um, to Rabbi Hal shows the Torah. Um, what we think is the Torah is about 500 years old, that it really is from the 1500s as opposed to the 1200s. And it may have been around the time of Rabbi Lowe, we're not sure. Um, there's a, the article is in the Cleveland Jewish News if you go to the Cleveland Jewish News Archives and put in about Holocaust Torah, you can bring up the article when we brought the Torah to our ark, when we walked it from, um, it actually was stored at Ruth Moskowitz's house once it came to Cleveland and it was restored. And then it was actually walked to the shul. It's a very nice article that you can read about the Torah. Oh, good. Wonderful. Um, thank you. Any other thoughts or questions or, or comments from people that have traveled there uh, about the about the Prague Jewish Quarter, or the the Alt Neuschul? Yeah, Nina. Um, 
Can you tell me a little bit about the design on the top of the synagogue and how old, do you know how old that part is? Was it an added on? On the outside. The sort of that, I don't know. Larry the said it looked back. almost like fire flames. Yeah. You know, that top part. Um, let me, I'm, I'm not, I'm not positive. Let me see if I can, I have it. Well, yeah, if, does anyone, is anyone familiar specifically with the, with the top piece? Um, I will, I will get back to you on that. <laughs> okay. Because I'm not, I'm not No sure. problem. No problem. Um, it, but, it but it is a unique, different. it is a unique, uh, a unique roof or, or right. top there. And it certainly looks very modern. I, I had to leave. I kept getting phone calls. Where is this synagogue? I'm sorry. I missed it. Sorry, in Prague. Prague. Oh, Prague. Prague. Okay. Lynn, um, but it's I'm, called the old new, the old, the old, yeah, that's the old right. right. Okay. Yeah, the Thanks. old new synagogue. The old new synagogue. Okay. Yeah. Roof. So I will, I will get back. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 When we, when we were there, it happened to be on a Saturday morning. And when we went down there to take a look, there was a guy, there a guard at the gate there. And unless you were a member, you couldn't come in on during services. Yeah, during services, right. right. Um, and that, you know, sadly, but but for for safety reasons and security reasons, many synagogues throughout Europe and, and in many parts of the world um, are like that. I recall, and maybe others of you have similar stories, uh, that I have relatives in, in Costa Rica, um, and we were going to go to the synagogue in San Jose, Costa Rica, which is an incredible synagogue, maybe the most, the, the nicest building in the whole country, perhaps. <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but in order to go, they said, you need to bring your passport and go to a specific location. You don't even see the synagogue from the street. It's so, so well hidden. They basically, you go, they tell you where on the side of the, the road, basically, to go, and there's a guard that's checking passports, and then he'll lead you. They like have a gate through like a, a, a path and it, the synagogue is completely hidden from view. You wouldn't even know it exists until you're like through the gates. Um, so there's not even a way to know about the synagogue unless you know basically where to go. It's, it's um, and that's uh, in parts of the world, uh, you know, we at Panea Shur and we always have a security guard in front, but, but are generally pretty open. Anyone can come in um, unless the security guard flags them, uh, and that's why they're why they're there. Uh, but in some parts of the world, uh, you need to you you need your passport or, or prior reservation, essentially, to even be able to get in for services. Um, yeah, Larry. I, I find it interesting that, that the bima, the eating table, is in the middle. I know Swartic still do that pretty much. W was that pretty much because it was orthodox or at the start? Because Ashkenazic synagogues now usually the bima is more towards the front rather than the middle. So right, most Ashkenazi construction had the bima in the front, and most Sephardi. I don't like. I don't always like using the word Sephardi because also a don't means raf. Other communities, different communities, had the the notion of the beam of the the bima, the amud, where the Torah was read in the center of the community. But it wasn't, it wasn't universal. Not every single synagogue did things the same way. And sometimes even for construction reasons, it was, would be easier. Um, but the notion of the Torah in the center uh, was, um, and still is in many communities, a prevailing idea of where the Torah should be read from, from the center. Um, in fact, at B'nai Yashurin, while it's not in the center, we read the Torah um, below the bima, so that it can be among the among the kahal, if you will, as opposed to kind of uh, farther away. Um, but no, a good so, note. In fact, that's where the GoPro, the camera, was actually stationed right at the amud, <laughs> and we were looking around from where the Torah was read. But before it used to be, B'nai Shurn had the the Torah up up, but then they lowered it so people who couldn't get up there. I thought that's why they did it. Right. Well, so to what well, right, it was lowered so that it, I mean, they're they're they go hand in hand. It was lowered uh, so that it could be among the people to an extent, but all but, but but that also means right people, especially those who are um who it's not wasn't accessible for to go up on the yeah. bima are able to reach the Torah table 
um, if someone wasn't able to walk up the up the bima, now there's an opportunity for everyone to uh, to participate right at the at the amud at the at the Torah stand. Um, so I want to jump now to the oh, now at last to a second synagogue, um, and. There might be some dispute. This one, there were there were four different constructions of building on the same exact site. But does anyone have a sense of what synagogue had the longest continuous use, uh, although not in use as for continuous use as a regular minion site today? Although I did have a uh, privilege to be able to daven mincha there at once. Uh, but but uh, a synagogue that was in use for about 1,100 years. <laughs> Does Lynn have a do you? I, I, I'm, what? I, I was gonna guess. Oh, I don't know. Does your answer? No, this is the show we just were at. I have. Oh, oh, I was. Just, I was gonna guess one out on the one of the one of the islands, but I'm That's not. That's what I, I was just, thinking so, of. Yeah, Curacao, but I don't know. Oh, Curacao. No, well, before <laughs> cruise ships. <laughs> the cruise the joy. No, it's actually in Cairo. The Ibn no, Ezra I, synagogue. I, I, I went there. I forgot all about that. I, I forgot to I've mention that. too. And some of you may have been there, so I'd love to hear from you. Um, we'll go. We'll go outside first. Um, in the medieval Fostat district, this is a, a picture of the synagogue today, and the entrance here. Um, there's also a, a famous Coptic church nearby, the Hanging right. uh, Church of the Hanging Gardens. Yep. Um, and this synagogue uh, was was originally uh, built, or actually, it was the land was actually in the and the building was actually purchased from a church on the site uh, prior. Uh, and actually, I believe the church was forced to sell uh, by the Sultan at the time uh, to build this synagogue in the year 882 of the Common Era. And what we're seeing today is the most recent renovation, uh, which took place in the late 1880s. Uh, so the synagogue itself uh, that we're seeing today is, is about 140 years old, uh, but, but in the same site um, and with continuous renovation four times over the course of those 1,100 years. Uh, today, of course, the Jewish community in Cairo is extremely small. I uh, could probably count uh, on two hands the number of, of Egyptian Jews in Cairo. Uh, my brother actually lived in Cairo for six months, um, and there were prayers uh, that were, he, he went to a Yom Kippur service. Uh, interestingly enough, that Yom Kippur service was led by none other than, than Seth Wykus, uh, who grew up <laughs> at Beth Am. Uh, uh, and I said, it's a small world that my brother goes to a service in Cairo that's, that they then connect about B'nai Asherin at the service. He talked with him afterwards and, and he, he messaged me. He's like, you never believe that I went to service and the guy is from B'nai Asherin. But... <laughs> Uh, Cheryl Wykus's uh, son, who was there working, I believe, with the State Department at the time. Uh, um, but this synagogue, and we can, uh, this is the, the entryway, and, and we're also looking from the Torah stand, which is in the middle of the sanctuary. Um, Sephardic, although Edot Mizrach is probably a better term. It's not uh, necessarily synagogue uh, in exactly the Sephardic style, but as we'll learn, some of the prominent Jews actually came uh, from Spain. Uh, the most well-known Jewish leader uh, who lived very close to the synagogue, although I think he mostly went to, um, to a different synagogue nearby, was Maimonides. Um, this was, uh, Maimonides lived just a short walk, Rambam lived just a short walk from this congregation, and this was the, Jew the heart of the Jewish uh, community uh, was in this neighborhood. Uh, for hundreds and hundreds, a thousand years. Uh, today, of course, in the 1950s, 1960s, uh, the remaining th uh, Jews that lived in Egypt mostly emigrated and, and made Aliyah to Israel or, or other places. Uh, so this synagogue today is mostly um, a museum and is still in existence today. Um, according to legend, this synagogue was built on the site where Pharaoh's daughter found baby Moses in the Nile. Um, and there's still, behind the synagogue is a well, um, and where the water, where it believes the Nile, believe the Nile ran, it's, it's moved course a little. 
but is, it was actually built on the site uh, that it was, it's believed that, that a baby Moses was, was discovered by Bat Paro um, and named Ibn Ezra synagogue, Ben Ezra for Ezra the scribe, uh, Ezra in the Bible. Um, and according to legend, an original Torah written by Ezra the scribe uh, was brought to this site. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that original Torah today, but, but that's the reason for the name. Um, the most well-known archaeological, and maybe not archaeological is not the right word, but the most incredible find from this synagogue um, and its second floor uh, was what is known as the Cairo Geniza. Um, and as many of you may be familiar with, uh, in the late 1800s, uh, Solomon Schechter uh, and others uh, discovered uh, pieces uh, of, of ancient documents or medieval documents being sold by Bedouins uh, and he, he found this document uh, that's, uh, that, that he got from a, someone, uh, someone showed him was the original writings of Ben Sirach uh, written, in, uh, written from about a thousand years earlier. Um, and he was fascinated. He wanted to learn where it was from. Um, and he eventually found the Bedouin that was selling it, uh, who took him to the, the storehouse, the storeroom in the synagogue, where, where ancient original handwritten documents from Maimonides and other Jewish leaders dating back a thousand years uh, were still stored. Um, and even though the synagogue was renovated, that storeroom became the repository uh, for documents that weren't being thrown out because they had God's name on it uh, and, and Torah documents, which now is the largest, uh, uh, the largest treasure trove of documents now stored um, at Cambridge University in, in England, at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, and in, in other, those are the two largest collections, but in other places as well, uh, to really uh, give us a tremendous amount of insight on what medieval Jewish life was like. Uh, and it, it comes from this synagogue that uh, because this synagogue stayed in its location um, and existed for over a thousand years from 882 of the Common Era and, until today, um, was able to provide such incredible insight uh, into Jewish life. Uh, both in Egypt and correspondence with, with Jews around the world um, throughout. Yeah, Fran. Uh, my book group did um, a discussion of the, the book, uh, The Night Watchman of Cairo, which I highly recommend because it, it really does, it's, it's all about this synagogue. And it's all about three different times in history with this continuous Arab uh, family that provided the, the watchman for the synagogue. But you do learn a lot about the synagogue in the different junctures of time. And I believe it was a, um, it was a Roman temple that was um, on the space before, before it was um, a synagogue. Okay, good. I think a, it may have converted from a Roman it was temple pagan. to a church. It was pagan. A pagan right. was. At some point it was a pagan site. Well, good, Maddie, yeah. Maybe I'm missing something, but what is the difference between the longest continuous synagogue and oldest continuous synagogue? Oh, so the, the only difference here is that this, the, the alt Neusch will still run services, maybe not daily, but still runs regular Shabbat services, um, and there's still a community that uses it regularly. Um, the, the synagogue in Egypt ran regular services until the 1960s, um, but the Jewish community largely left town and there aren't regular services at all scheduled or, or running in, in the Ibn Ezra synagogue today. You can thank Nasser for why they left town. So, yeah, so the, the difference is that one synagogue is still being used as a synagogue for services and, and the synagogue in Egypt is not being used anymore. Uh, for, for synagogue services. Although they did permit us, I went, uh, when I was studying in Israel as part of my studies to be a rabbi, um, I went with a group of, uh, with a group of classmates and friends uh, to, to Egypt, to Cairo and to Luxor. Um, and we went to the synagogue and they permitted us when they heard who our group was. Normally they, they don't do this, I guess, but we, we asked and explained who we were and they, they closed off the synagogue for about 10, 15 minutes for us to pray uh, mincha there when we went in the afternoon, uh, which was very, uh, which was very courteous of them, and was was really a powerful experience to be able to be in this in this place and and bring back Jewish life um, in a way that it doesn't see regularly. Um, 
Yeah, Lynn. The, yeah. Well, you you were talking about Ben Ezra. What? Um, you, yeah. you, you, you they actually opened it up for you. You were saying Ben Ezra was that the one or uh, did I miss the Ben Ezra synagogue? Yeah. Okay, I, it's like when I was I was there long. I was there in '87, so it's been a while. And when we were when I was there, the place was closed, and like there were people living in it who didn't even mm -hmm. they weren't even associated with the place. It was it was pretty much a mess. So they must have cleaned it up since then. Because you went so from then, yeah, from what you're describing, it's been cleaned up since then, yeah. Oh, okay. And now it's a tour. It's, I mean, if you were to go, I don't know who's going to Cairo yeah. right now, right. Um, but but if you're to, you look on like Cairo tourism and travel places, it, it'll show up as a place to visit. Um, and in the in the old quarter, um, the medieval quarter of uh, of Cairo, uh, then known as Fostat, was the was the name of the the neighborhood and district. Uh, when Maimonides and other Jewish leaders lived there. Um, so I want to close by really asking um, for any thoughts of, of communities, because uh, we'll look at synagogues, but also unique communities around the world um, where, they've, where they've built synagogues everywhere from, uh, from Biro Bijan in, in Siberia, the Yiddish community, uh, to synagogues in Indonesia, to the Amazon, uh, places where, where there's unlikely communities or incredible synagogues uh, that have been built. But I'd love to hear, um, to take notes because I'll uh, get to get, we'll be able to do tours of various places. Yeah, Karen. Um, I don't know if you consider it a synagogue or not. When we were in Tel Aviv with one of the rabbi's tours, I forget what year it was, in, in the um, early 2000s, um, on Friday evening, the men went to one place and the women, we were in this artist studio and there was a woman's service and we all sat around on cushions. It was incredible. And the woman, the rabbi's wife who was leading our service sat in the middle and, and we were all praying while she was nursing her baby. And I thought that was kind of cool. I, just, I thought that was a real cool way to pray. No, definitely. That sounds like a, a wonderful experience. How many yeah. weeks do you plan to uh, offer this uh, class? Um, well, to be honest, we're going to, it'll be through the Weingold period until the Thursday before Thanksgiving, but happy to continue it ongoing. Um, and, and we'll continue. So we'll, we'll go to there and then we'll see where, based on who's in the class, in the group, we'll continue uh, running and, and would love to have, um, if there's anyone in the group that wants to present on a particular synagogue that you visited, um, we'd love to have uh, guest presenters of a particular synagogue for part of a of a session as well. So, so if yeah, we're going to run out of synagogues. So there's there's a, <laughs> there's no shortage of synagogues around the world, and and right as as I think Helen asked where the synagogues are going to be anywhere around the world. They could be in the United States or Israel, where the largest communities are today. But certainly there are synagogues, Jewish communities around the world, and even places like Egypt, where there may not be such a large community today, but where there's tremendous uh, Jewish history um, in synagogues. Yeah, Lynn. Um, I've been to Ireland, England, and Scotland many times, but I've, I've never seen any synagogues in Ireland or Scotland. And I was wondering about Dublin, because Dublin at one time, the mayor of Dublin was Jewish. If, has anybody yeah, there been are, to there anybody? are about a thousand, I think fifteen hundred, a thousand to fifteen hundred Jews across Ireland, mostly in Dublin. Um, th there are synagogues. I don't know that there's any like notably notable architecturally, but okay. we'll definitely I'll look into that to 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 see if we can tour one of the synagogues in in Ireland. But there are there is a small Irish Jewish community, and and there's actually more Jews even in Scotland, a few thousand. Um, Jews in, I think, Edinburgh and Glasgow primarily, although I met, now I'm blanking, I met a Jew, Jew once from a different community in Scotland as well. Um, so there are, there are synagogues in Scotland as well, definitely. I think and even Wales, another... I think even Wales has a Jewish community somewhere. Well, yeah, there is a, there is a Jewish commu a well, a community in Wales as well, yeah. And there's a, I have a friend whose husband um, grew up in Houghton, Michigan, far western Upper Peninsula. There's a very old synagogue up there. Um, yeah, Iron Mountain. I actually have yeah. a... Okay, okay. Um, in Iron Mountain, Michigan, actually, uh, the white... Well, I don't know that anyone... Maddie might know Rebecca Starr from Ramah. I don't know if, if she was there. Uh, grew up... So the, a rabbi uh, at uh, Congregation Shari Tzedek uh, in Detroit, which is a prominent conservative synagogue, uh, his wife 
uh, who's a Jewish educator, I actually grew up um, in, in near Iron Mountain and went to the, the synagogue in the, in the Western Upper Peninsula, where there is a small but old Jewish community that, that lives there and, and went there for lumber and other, other trades uh, that's there, yeah. Yeah, uh, Nina, and, and yeah, feel free to jump in, yeah. Uh, speaking of synagogues, like in small places, um, by, by just a, a chance, I ended up going to college in a very small town in Pennsylvania, Chambersburg, which isn't too far from Gettysburg. And uh, to my surprise, there was a synagogue in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, which, um, which brings me to a question that that might be interesting uh, if there, I don't know if that synagogue was of any note, but uh, the town was burned down, unfortunately, during the Civil War. But I wonder if there are some very small town synagogues that might be of note uh, that would be interesting, because as we all know, Jews live everywhere. Uh, you know, even right. like, um, like Vermont or you know. Right. So there are right the Woodstock so. the Woodstock yeah. community synagogue in in yeah. rural Vermont um, and and in Ketchum, Idaho, uh, exactly. and and Iron Mountain, Michigan, as you said, and, and yeah. a fascinating story in in Dothan, Alabama, where they're paying Jews. Uh, Jewish young couples to move wow. there to rebuild. Um, there are there yeah. are synagogues all over. One of the sad stories, um, is just a reality of the time, is that many of the Jews from smaller communities and, and rural areas are moving and, and their children, the, the younger generation are moving away. And you have stories, I mean, we see it even with Youngstown and, and communities where people are coming to the bigger city, that communities are dwindling and, and sometimes dying off. Um, uh, there's a story, another place in Pennsylvania where the synagogue actually had a large endowment and a lot of money. It just didn't have any people uh, because the people had left. Um, and so we can def we'll definitely can look at some smaller community synagogues, but unfortunately, more and more often, that's, that's a phenomenon that, that we're seeing, that the synagogues are there, but the people um, are, the numbers are dwindling in, in many smaller communities. I, I, grew up in, I grew up in Tiffin, Ohio. Our synagogue yeah. was 20 miles away in Fremont, Ohio, would no longer exist, but it was yeah. vibrant at, the, at when it was, when I grew, was growing up there, it was, uh, it was uh, vibrant and active and uh, we, uh, services were led by, by uh, usually people who grew up in the Orthodox tradition. Uh, my bar mitzvah rabbi was Alan Lutovsky. <laughs> wow! <laughs> I was it's a small world. <laughs> I was I was taught by a uh, my father used to used to take me uh, drive me to Toledo, uh, which was about sixty miles away from Tiffin, uh, three times a week to learn with an old, very very orthodox uh, rabbi, who didn't speak a word of English. W was all was all in uh, was all in Yiddish. And if you yeah. made a mistake in reading the Torah, he'd give you a swatch. He had a little <laughs> yeah. switch. And he'd always, he would say, oh, my kinder, acham der lieb. He would say, yeah. you know, he would apologize for giving me a swatch. That was small town, uh, growing up in a small town uh, Jewish uh, atmosphere. Yeah, but good, Va fascinating. Good, any, any other last stories or places that you're interested in? Um, cool. I did and have exploring. one exploring. We're going to wrap up in a, in a minute. Yeah. What about um, Shanghai? Are there any interesting synagogues? Ah, uh, good. There? Shanghai yeah. is actually a place that I'd like to, to share. And, and, and Shanghai is a, is a fascinating Jewish community. Um, and like I'll just that. share for those who are still on next week. Yep. Um, I look forward to, to, to touring with you as a couple of the largest synagogues in the world um, and most attended. Two that we'll look at, but then I'll also take some of what we talked to look at Shanghai and maybe others, depending on the time we have. Uh, but definitely we'll look at um, two of the largest synagogues. The largest synagogue, there's actually some dispute, but one synagogue that lays claim to being the largest synagogue in the world is, is Congregation Emmanuel in New York City. Maybe you've been on, on the Upper East Side. I um, mean, another synagogue that lays claim, but certainly lays the claim to the largest um, average attendance at services every Shabbat morning is the Bells uh, Beit Midrash, the, the Bells Great Synagogue in Jerusalem, uh, which has an average of, of almost 5,000 people every single Shabbat um, that attend. Uh, so we'll look at those two synagogues and others uh, next week. 
um, and I'll take notes here uh, to, to add more, but each week, uh, please feel free uh, to come in and, and please, uh, we'd love to, I'd love to have you share uh, your, your knowledge from, from travels or, 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 or where you grew up um, as well. So thanks, it was great having everyone and, and look forward to seeing everyone next uh, Thursday. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Take care. Take Bye, care. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Take care.